Mini episode 729 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome, everyone, to FDH Lounge mini-episode number 729. You have with you today FDH Lounge dignitaries Rick Morris and Ben Chu. Of course, Ben also managing editor of that NBA lottery pick, and he has been on this show a number of times talking hoops, among other subjects, with us. And, of course, uh, at uh, that NBA lottery pick.com, they have a, a very special project just underway, and we'll be talking about that a little bit, uh, that project being hashtag basketball detectives. We'll be talking about that with Ben and previewing the NBA Finals, which will be, of course, a rematch from last year, the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Golden State Warriors, right down to Golden State having home court again. So we will be going through the same scenario as last year, except we have a different head coach on one side. We have healthy players on one side who are not there, some notable offseason signings and trading deadline acquisitions. So things will be different, but they will also be the same, and it will be the same two teams. And from a network perspective, the same in terms of Curry versus LeBron, the consensus top two players in the NBA at this point in time. Bring in good friend Ben Chu to talk about all of this. Ben, Good to have you back on, my friend. How are you today? I'm doing good, Rick. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, buddy. Uh, I am, uh, of course, overjoyed from a personal perspective that my Cleveland Cavaliers are back in. We believe in transparency on the FDH Lounge. And, again, uh, I did not pick the Cavs to win in the finals last year. So we, we kind of you know put our biases out there and let people factor in how much to discount or not discount based on that. I'd like to think that there's a minimum of discounting that has to go on with my analysis. Uh, I am certainly very hopeful that my Cavs are going to get the job done this year and uh, more confident than I was at this time last year due to the health issue, among other things. So uh, that may portend my prediction. It may not. Uh, I know that uh, you are also fond of the Cavs from your time having been spent in Cleveland a couple of years ago, and I know you are very excited about what is going to be uh, another great NBA Finals. Well, it's going to be another great one, Rick. And overall, the the NBA cannot be more happy to have a rematch of last season's finals. And a little bit, Cleveland has a more stronger team than last year, obviously, due to the injuries of Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love. It feels to me that Golden State has played exceptionally well, and especially that incredible three games, the one comeback against Oklahoma City in the Western Conference Finals prove that they have the mental and the mental toughness to get through anything at this point. But it's going to be very interesting because I think a lot of people would know this doesn't feel like the Golden State team that rolled through the regular season to 73 wins. But if, if they, but of all teams, if they have to deal with any sort of distractions or any sort of issues in the finals, this is probably the team that can deal with those distractions. You have to think so. And again, as you alluded to, that very, very stirring punctuation to their comeback in the seven game series against Oklahoma city. I mean, I think that's a game seven. None of us will ever forget as far as the way that they managed to get the job done in the end there. And again, that brings them back into the finals here versus the Cavs who were waiting for them. The highest rated finals in 2015 since 1998, the last Jordan finals in the NBA, which really kind of surprised me. It outpaced any of the Kobe finals, including the ones with Kobe and Shaq or Kobe versus the Celtics. It managed to pull a higher number. I have been saying to some of my friends around here, and again, it doesn't seem like there's as much uh, top-down goofiness in the league now that Adam Silver is commissioner. But if you believe in the concept of shenanigans still, you got to think for once in your life, it benefits you as a Cleveland fan. Because think about it. What's in the best interest of the league? It's in the best interest of the league because i got to think the ratings are going to be even higher than last year. This is now an established rivalry, Cleveland v. Golden State, which it wasn't going into last year. The league is looking ahead. You have to think to next year. And if the rubber match was to, was to break a 1-1 tie 
wouldn't that challenge some of the all-time ratings that the league has ever had? So you have to think from a monetary perspective, it's in the league's best interest for the Cavs to win. Now, again, I don't know this as much in the way of shenanigans with calls in the Adam Silver era as we all did during the David Stern era, but uh, it's got to be encouraging if you're a Cleveland fan to look at it that way. Well, overall, again, I, I do not speak for the league, and I do not speak for any sort of conspiracy theorist. But if you're if you're <laughs> Adam Silver in the NBA right now, you're you're very pleased. You you have your the, the team that won you know 73 regular season games in the finals going up against LeBron James and the Cavaliers, a team that many people you know in the Eastern Conference thought was the top team of the entire season. So. If you're in the NBA, you're in a good mood right now because you're going to have another BAFO ratings from, you know, the Bay Area and then obviously from the eastern region of the United States. Just from a business perspective as well, since we're on that a little bit, it's very, very interesting that uh, this just adds to uh, one heck of a trilogy, I think, for both markets in this calendar year. The Bay Area, of course, was hosting their second Super Bowl, first one since 1985, that back in February, of course. They're also getting the Stanley Cup Finals right now, which, again, couldn't have been forecast too far ahead of time. The NBA Finals as well, that's, uh, that, that's a great one, two, three punch right there. Rivaled on a metropolitan sense by what Cleveland is getting, the NBA Finals being the first act, the Republican National Convention the second act, the third act is Steve Miocha now hosting – uh, his world heavyweight title defense at UFC 203 in the fall. So this is something where big events, big excitement, really coursing through both markets, if you will, at this point in time for a number of reasons, but right now focused on basketball. Right. Well, it's a golden age, especially right now in the NBA, and you can debate whether the 80s or 90s or the 2000s were tougher, but the league, after a small sort of period after Kobe won, his fifth championship sort of hit a little bit of a lull there. And then Miami got their couple of titles. And now you have sort of the feel good team of the last two seasons in golden state. And, you know, their star Stephen Curry has played out has been, you know, he's played outstanding the entire season. The playoffs have been a little bit, there's been some rust there, but you know, golden state ha- just has that team mentality and it doesn't hurt when your second leading scorer is a guy like Clay Thompson. That's a great point. I was going to go right to that, actually, in terms of uh, I know a couple weeks from when we're taping this, uh, you and I are going to be evaluating yet again FDH's annual list of the top 30 players in the NBA. And, of course, there's always that jockeying at the top, Curry and LeBron, as was the case last year. But when you go further down in the top 10, it's very interesting because last year they were neck and neck for where they were positioned, and this year should be no different. Clay Thompson on the one side, Kyrie Irving on the other side, Kyrie, I won't say a shell of himself in game one last year, but extremely hobbled, and that was the last we saw of him in the finals. This year he has been terrific in the playoffs. The handles have been great, the passing, the outside scoring. Pretty much he's been on point the whole way through. So while everyone is looking at the major battle of Curry v. LeBron and who is able to affect their team more in that way, when you're looking at the 1A player on either team, that looks like it is going to be probably at least an equally important matchup, yes? Right, and I completely agree with that. Kyrie's had a relatively solid postseason so far. And, you know, it, it helps that Cleveland has a healthy Kevin Love. Their bench is much improved. But I think it's going to be very interesting if, it's, if, we, if we get down to, like, the nitty-gritty of everything. It's going to be a very interesting matchup between Cleveland's bigs of Tim, Timothy Mozgov and Tristan Thompson going up against Andrew Bogan and Festus Azili. Both teams, very good rebounding teams. And it, during the Oklahoma City series, we were able to see that Golden State not, a, you know, has, a, you know, can get rebounds, but that's pretty much right now Cleveland's MO. They're one of the top offensive rebounding teams in the league. And Tristan Thompson currently leads the NBA playoffs in offensive rebounds. So, it's going to be very interesting. I think both teams have that offensive balance. It's really probably going to come down to if Curry is 100% and is, you know, putting down 30, 40, 50 point performances, it's going to be very tough to beat Golden State. In terms of questioning whether somebody's at 100% or were during the season, you mentioned a name we haven't heard much at all during the playoffs, really aside from garbage time, that being Team of Fame Osgoff for the Cavs. And it's very, very intriguing because when he was acquired. In the winter of 2015, it was with the thought that 
uh, being that kind of a rim protector was going to be a, a vital cog to the Cavs winning the championship. He has that dominant game in the finals last year. Steve Kerr decides to go small and completely kind of takes him out the rest of the way here. So I'm, I'm intrigued to hear you mention his name because, yeah, if, if Bogut's going to be in there to a good degree, you assume that he's going to be there as well. Having said that, one of the biggest heroes for the Cavs in this postseason, and there have been a number of them for that 12-2 and two run through the East, but Channing Frye, who actually hit 23 of his first 36 three-point attempts. So you've got him in there. You've got the ability with, with him, Thompson, and Love, combined, put one of those three guys in at center at a given point in time and pretty much ignore Mozgov if you want to. That's what they've been doing a good chunk of the way. Do you believe that we're going to see a lot more of Mozgov than we've been seeing thus far, which would be really, really a kind of ironic considering the way Golden State took them out last year? Right. At this point, especially early in the, in the, you know, in the prediction of the finals or in the period of time in games one, game two, I don't think we're going to see – a lot of Moscow necessarily, but it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out because you would assume with a big body like Andrew Bogut, the most likely candidate for Cleveland to play would be Moscow because they match up relatively well against each other. I still think both teams are going to go small for the majority of the series, but if Cleveland and Thompson gets into foul trouble, it wouldn't shock me if Moscow might be the first guy off the bench. And again, this has nothing to do with Channing Fry, who's had an unbelievable postseason. But he's going to be ro- he's going to be part of that rotation no matter what. But it's going to come down Absolutely. because Bogut has played on and off all on and off during the the Oklahoma State series. There are some games he played well, and then some games he completely disappeared. Well, yeah, and Mozgov definitely will be a factor, like you say, if Bogut is going to be in there, and that's what seems to be the determinant. So it sounds like a lot of this is going to kind of be in Steve Kerr's hands as far as how he wants to approach it. Mozgov really, again, had a fitful regular season, eventually losing that spot in the rotation. Probably never really came back 100% from the off-season surgery. He has had copious time to be able to kind of sit and recover. So hopefully, uh, I say that as a Cavs fan, hopefully he's back good enough to play, uh, assuming that he is needed. Now, in terms of looking at this overall, and I spoke before of wearing the fan hat and wearing the analyst hat, so... I want you to kind of keep me correct on this here as far as my optimism looking ahead to this series. Because when I look at the Cavs relative to a year ago, you've mentioned a couple of the major points. A healthy Kyrie Irving, a healthy Kevin Love. You have a better J.R. Smith, particularly the way he's been playing defense the second half of the season. Plus, as you've indicated to me previously, off air, he won't have to be the number two scorer, number two option as he was in the finals last year in that emergency. So you got that going. Channing Fry, who wasn't here last year, Richard Jefferson, who wasn't here last year, and an unconditional buy-in from this team for what Ty Lu, the new head coach, is doing, whereas I think uh, fair weather buy-in is, I think, a, a good way of saying how they related to David Blatt. Uh, when the times were going good, when the team was winning, everything was great. Anything short of that, and things were kind of rocky. You don't have that with Ty Lu. So I see a lot of differences for the Cavs, pretty much all of them positive. I don't see a lot of differences from Golden State for a year ago, but they were the champs. It's not as though they had to improve that much in any way. They did have a 73-9 and regular season mark, although, as you said, as the competition's gotten tougher, the record has gotten worse. In terms of all this ground that the Cavs look to have made up on paper on Golden State, how do you see it? I see it like this, Rick. I, I think they're – Right now, you would say at this point, if everyone is 100% for both teams, they're about 50-50. You could really honestly see the series going either way because we we kind of have seen that Golden State it has been the elite team all season. They played exceptionally well. But recently, Golden State in the playoffs against Portland and against you know Houston for that game when Harden went bonkers, they are vulnerable. If Curry isn't 100%, we have uh, – it's going to be interesting, right? Like right now, if you're judging based on his performance in the Oklahoma City series, you would say, hey, this isn't the MVP of the league. This is a very good player, but he isn't the MVP. But I think ultimately it's going to come down to if Golden State runs into some turmoil early in the series and Cleveland can steal a game in Oakland – that might be their best chance to win this series. Well, based on your 
schedule with, uh, again, with your day job and knowing your schedule as intricately as I do, I always say that there's probably nobody that I know personally who watches more NBA than you do. So uh, you're a good person to ask this question to. In terms of the Cavs personnel, in terms of what they can do, what their capabilities are, any of the things that Golden State suffered against Oklahoma City, and, and again, not enough in the end to tip the balance of the series, but Oklahoma City really kind of made them look human for a couple of games there. Is there anything as far as what the Cavs are able to execute where Ty Lue was able to kind of sit there, take notes, and say, hmm, that's going to be really useful for us to try against Golden State? It's going to be interesting because if just looking at it on a one-on-one basis, you're not going to find a guy like Russell Westbrook on Cleveland. He was a huge right. part to the series with Oklahoma City that his, his ungodly athleticism just pretty much allowed him to get whatever he wanted in the paint. Now, one thing that Cleveland has been doing while they've been shooting the three, well, outside of games three and four in Toronto, they've shot over 45% from three in their other playoff games. So if they can spread the four and at least keep pace with Golden State, they have a very good chance to win some games. They have the talent. They have the depth now with Fry and Jefferson. As long as they don't see Stephen Curry a unanimous MVP, they have a very good shot to, to make this either a series or win the championship. Very simply. Yeah, and they actually, again, just sort of on paper, seem to be at least a little bit deeper than Golden State. As I'm looking at the rosters here, once again, you anticipated very well with where I wanted to go about this in terms of the three-point shooting. I wanted to ask you about that. You talk about the Cavs keeping pace, and it's a tall task, given the way that Golden State has operated the last two years, but the Cavs have certainly looked like they're up to it recently. Moreover, they've actually been a better three-point shooting team in the playoffs than has been Golden State. So I'm going to ask you about that part of it, if that has the possibility to be a determinant in and of itself. If the Cavs are better at shooting the three ball than Golden State in this series, given how critical the three is to the Warriors' attack, does that pretty much mean the Cavs win the series if they can do better than Golden State? I think you can't assume that they would do – if they do better in Golden State, they would win the series. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. The key with Golden State is, is that they are one of the biggest teams I've ever seen in NBA history that can rise and fall as quickly on the offensive end. They can get 20 points in under four minutes, and then they can go for a small amount of points. The real point I'm going to try and make here is, is that if Cleveland shoots the three, well, it will keep them in games against Golden State, and especially having to deal with that crowd at Oracle Arena in Oakland. If you can stay in the game, essentially, very similar to how OKC did in game one of that series, if you stay in the game and give yourself a chance to win, that's all really that matters about Golden State. The point, the way you can beat Golden State and how a lot of coaches sort of were able to figure it out, you have to beat them on the boards and you have to make your shots and you have to keep the crowd out of the game. Those are all very important elements, and that's the kind of thing where, again, home court looks like it's going to be overwhelmingly critical if it goes to a game seven uh, as is generally the case in the nba or any of the major sports really but again with the crowd with the way that golden state has played there with the determination of trying to defend that title under those circumstances again i guess you never say never when it's lebron on the other side but you'd have to think golden state's a very strong favorite if it comes to that Let's get into what we think is going to happen in the series here ultimately. A year ago, I correctly predicted that Golden State would win, albeit in seven games. That was before uh, Kyrie went down for good, and uh, we ended up shaving a game off of that. In the end, Golden State took it in six. I think it'll end in six this time around, but I think the 52-year drought, not counting Steve Amiochik, I think comes to an end in Cleveland on the home floor at the queue. I'm picking Cavs in six for this one. If we let it get away in six, I think it's going to be a very, very difficult salvage job in seven. But I'm going to to go out on a limb and say Cavs in six. What say you, Ben Chu? Well, overall, I think this would be one of the tougher series to predict, only just because there could be so many variances and different outcomes. Yep. There's only two outcomes I've really – you know, anything can change this series. But there are – essentially, if we're going on raw data and everyone is, you know – relatively healthy to healthy. There are no major injuries. There's only two outcomes. I, I, I either see Cleveland in six or Golden State in seven. This is a toss-up, in my opinion, at that point, because either team could pull it off. But I'm going to just be the contrarian here and go Golden State in seven because you would think with all the, you know, all the drama and all the you know, excitement based on their season and how they had to come back against Oklahoma City, you, 
you just have to assume that they're going to just have that little bit left in the tank to pull it out at the end. Well, let me ask you this. Last question on this uh, before we get to uh, something else I want to talk about with you. My question would be, in terms of what they have already overcome, a grueling seven games against Oklahoma City, two separate injuries to Steph Curry in this offseason where I maintain to this point that he's still not 100%. Are we looking at a situation here where Golden State is going to have enough left in the tank later in the series? You, you seem pretty confident that they will. I think uh, as the series go on, Golden State will get stronger. But the real thing for Cleveland on, on, the, on the bright side for them if Golden State plays like they've played so far in the Portland series and in the Oklahoma City series, they have a very good opportunity to win because this isn't the Golden State team that was blowing teams out by 20 or 30 in the regular season. This is a Golden State team that's having to eke out close games. And they always, say, they always have this rule in sports that if, you have, if you're essentially trying to eke out games to get to the finals, it's not necessarily the best thing to do. So Cleveland has a shot, but it's going to be – I just think it's going to be very tough, especially the way that Golden State came back against OKC to be able to just just turn that off. It feels like Team of Destiny almost, but again, it could. In all honesty, I think it could really go either way. It is going to be fascinating, regardless. In our time remaining, Ben, I want to talk about this your great new project, of course, the NBA Lottery Pick dot com, where you were the managing editor. People can check this out via Twitter at that NBA Lottery Pick. Because on Periscope, you have this new great uh, basketball series, uh, a mixture of basketball and comedy, uh, and a little bit of uh, detective work here, too, hence the name. Hashtag Basketball Detectives. Now, people can check this out on demand on your account on Periscope uh, due to the recent tweak that they made to allow that. If people want to catch it live, because this is being shot live, as is the case with Periscope, the first original entertainment, as best as I can tell, on the Periscope platform so congratulations for that live you can catch it mondays at midnight eastern nine o'clock pacific and uh, again talk about that ben uh what you've got going on there a very fascinating project well it's a very fascinating project rick because as you know we are hit we are entering the live streaming culture now that everyone must you know pr- produce themselves at a moment's notice to to a vast wide audience what we're essentially doing with hashtag basketball detectives is that we're creating a fictional universe of these two detectives who deal with basketball-related mysteries. In season one, they have to deal with a man who has possibly eaten some tainted uh, bakery food, and they find out essentially in the future that this was all a devious plan by a mastermind or an arch nemesis of the series. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide some live theater improv a lot of this stuff, we obviously, as you can understand, since there is a storyline, we do have this planned out a little bit. But we do, but none of the dialogue you will probably hear during the show is that scripted. And I think it's a brand new way for, you know, traditional people because we all, and you know this too, Rick. We all have our phones. It's a way to get new media out there. And it's a way to take, you know, you've had a hard time. You had a hard time during your week. You have five minutes to kill. Why not watch a new episode of Basketball Detectives? Absolutely, and for people wanting to get ca- caught up, uh, the beauty of it, as far as the uh, the way the medium goes, is uh, it will not take you long to binge. It'll take significantly less time than it took me to binge on the path on Hulu season one. So uh, people can check this out and get caught up. One episode in the books, nine to go. Looking forward to seeing it the rest of the way. And uh, again, Ben, always a pleasure to have you on, my man. We will catch up shortly on the program here, talking our annual FDH top 30 players in the NBA, get your assessment on that list as we always do. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to a great finals. And I thank you so much for your analysis and breaking it down. All right. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Go Cavs. Go Cavs. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I think this is the year. Uh, Let's go Cavs. And again, the NBA finals are going to be amazing. Thank you, Ben, for being a part of the show today. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to FDH Lounge mini episode number 729. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time 
Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QBC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 